Good morning, and thank you all for being here. Today, the committee continues its oversight of the federal government's use of suspension and debarment, a process that is supposed to prevent taxpayers' money from going to the bad apples of the contracting world. Suspension and debarment can be an effective tool for federal agencies to ensure contractor performance. Unfortunately, as we will hear today, the suspension and debarment tools often goes unused, quietly rusting away in the procurement toolbox. More than $500 billion of the taxpayers' money goes to federal contractors each year. It is a massive job to ensure that billions of dollars in taxpayers' money is spent effectively and wisely, and that federal dollars do not go to the incompetent and the unproductive, the con men and the con women. Suspension and debarment is the last line of defense against fraud and abuse, and should only be used in the most serious cases. But suspension and debarment only protects our government if agencies use it. In February last year, we held a hearing on the operation and use of excluded parties list system. We found that some government agencies were ignoring federal regulations by awarding funds to individuals or businesses that had been suspended or debarred. We also found that federal agencies took far too long to suspend or debar if they did it at all. Now, a year later, it seems little has changed. In three separate reports, the Inspector General of the Dep Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Transportation, and the U.S. Agency for International Development found that their respective agencies have failed to use the suspension and debarment system or have been so slow in using that the poor performers raked in millions and millions and millions in the time period. For example, the DOT and IG found that on average, it took DOT 300 days to reach a suspension decision and 415 days to process a debarment decision. These decisions are supposed to be made within 45 days. In one such delay, the IG found that one Kentucky company committed contract fraud by bribing an official to receive bid information. During the 10 months it took DOT to suspend this company, they received $24 million in Recovery Act funds. Similarly, at DHS, the IG found that DHS had only 10 debarment cases in four years, an incredibly low number for an agency that spends an enormous, enormous percentage of its budget through contracting. In one glaring example, there were no debarment actions by FEMA, an agency that had well-publicized problems with contractors doing Hurricane Katrina. That, to me, is very interesting. Unfortunately, the news isn't much better at USAID. The IG found that GA Paper, International, and Ramtech Overseas Incorporated admitted that they had submitted more than 100 false claims for reimbursement. Though they agreed to pay $1.3 million to the government, USAID never initiated a suspension or debarment action. If you aren't going to suspend or debar contractors for fraud, what does it take? As the old saying goes, fool me once, shame on you. But fool me twice, shame on me. In this case, shame on our government for being fooled over and over and over again by the same contractors. It is way past time for agencies to suspend and debar bad actors and for agency managers to aggressively enforce this process. As I've said before and I want to emphasize today, 
I'm not against contracting or contractors. I am against weak management and poor contractor performance. I know that responsible contractors and the witnesses today share this view as well. The failure to enforce the law against bad actors is unfair to responsible companies and it is unfair to the taxpayers whose money we're using. I look forward to hearing from both management and the IGs about what can be done to address this problem. I will now yield to the ranking member of the committee from California, Congressman Issa, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. As you recall, the first hearing held by this committee after you became chairman was on substantially the same subject. I will ask today that you join me in a letter asking for the GAO to update their findings so that we can look forward to not only having new facts, but in all likelihood, new enforcement. That objection, I will join. I will join you on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The goal of today's hearing is not just to shed light on an ongoing issue, but to make sure that the industry of both contractors and the government agencies that oversee those contractors realize that the time, as the chairman said, is long overdue to bring about quick and predictable disbarment and suspension. Each of us may have different examples of those entities which should be suspended or disbar debarred. The truth is all of the chairman's uh, likely candidates should be scrutinized and either cleared or taken off the rolls, and all of my candidates, I suspect, should be either evaluated and cleared or taken off the rolls. It is, in fact, in my opinion, every single contractor's responsibility to live up to a high standard, and if there's any question from any quarter as to their conduct, it should be thoroughly investigated. Just yesterday, at the Chairman's Directive, we reviewed the question of both contractors and private individuals, either employees or uh, government contractors, who are seriously delinquent in their taxes, whether they should also be ineligible for contract or even employment. Although there is not bipartisan support on how to achieve this, there is bipartisan recognition that bad actors make for bad government. Mr. Chairman, I will delve slightly into one partisan uh, example, but I do so for a reason. We in the Congress voted on a bipartisan and overwhelming basis in the House and the Senate to debar, or sorry, to defund ACORN. Whether we agree with federal court decisions now pending or not, it is clear that some members of the court believe that the Association of Community Organizations for Reform Now, better known as ACORN, in their opinion, cannot be defunded by congressional fiat. That begs the real question. Why is it there were people repeatedly breaking laws, being indicted, and even convicted, and still operating within that organization? In fact, funds still being received even after it was shown that funds of the federal government had been embezzled and covered up. This is an example where, from this, this dais, we cannot bring about effective enforcement. We should not, on a regular basis, take up the question of any company or any organization. But in order to live to that expectation that I think the Chairman and I want us to do, which is to never again have a House floor vote or a Senate vote related to defunding an organization, we must call on our agencies to do their job not only better, but much quicker. So, Mr. Chairman, my apologies for something which has often been considered uh, uh, to be partisan, but I believe that that partisanship would have been completely unnecessary, and tough votes for people on both sides would have been unnecessary if, in fact, the use of these tools had been aggressive. None of us would have questioned if an organization or an individual had been reviewed and properly cleared, but to not be reviewed to go on receiving additional funds by any organization, including contractors and, quite frankly, even the continuation of federal employees, must, in fact, reach a higher standard, one that the chairman 
uh, made clear by having his first hearing on this subject and is making clear today by having an additional clear, uh, hearing. So I join with the chairman in all of his remarks and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman from California for his statement. and also thank him for the work that he has done you know, on this issue as well. Thank you. Uh, at this time, uh, we will uh, now. I yield to the, let me first of all, let me check if anyone else has an opening statement. I, I yield to the gentleman from um, Florida Thank you so for much, Mr. Towns, Mr. Chairman, for uh, yielding. And uh, as, a, as the Republican leader of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, I take particular interest in today's hearing. And thank you for holding it. And I, I, I wish we were doing a, an even better job in our committee, Transportation and Infrastructure. We do have a lot of responsibility as the largest committee in Congress and a lot of oversight. But uh, I'm particularly interested in, in uh, what you have found here, and it does give me great uh, concern. Uh, we have tried to, d to conduct um, a regular uh, uh, overview of the stimulus dollars, and um, I think that's very important because it was a huge amount of money. I, now, I think now it's scored at somewhere around $862 billion. Uh, today the President has a, uh, is going to sign a, a so-called jobs bill at, at $17 billion or $18 billion, however you figure it. And it also has a high emphasis on infrastructure and T&I uh, projects. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm deeply concerned about getting that money out. We, um, to date, as of March 3rd, the last report I had from our committee staff, of $48 billion in stimulus money that went through the Department of Transportation of the 600, I'm sorry, $862 billion, the $48 billion, only 18 percent had gotten out, which gives me great angst about what, went, what the President's going to sign today, a much smaller amount, even getting that money out, and people uh, not having jobs. My state uh, rose uh, uh, in unemployment in the January report to one of the top ten. Uh, but the difficulty in getting money out is one thing, oversight is another thing, but then to find out that the Department of Transportation uh, is, is not being a, a, a good overseer of those uh, contractors and those vendors who are getting some of this money. Uh, and if you read the report, and uh, again, this is a, this is a very shocking report uh, that's come out by the Inspector General of DOT, it takes so long that um, uh, it takes so long to uh, disbar someone or find them ineligible that we may have, in fact, already given. And I have some reports, and I'm having our staff investigate it. We have, may have given money to people who uh, who who should have should not be participating in this process. So we aren't getting the money out. We're possibly giving the money to people who who shouldn't be eligible players uh, in this. And uh, again, it, it's deeply uh, uh, concerning and, and frustrating uh, from, from our standpoint. But I thank you for conducting this hearing. Uh, I, I've gonna, we're going to dedicate some of our investigative staff to going after folks who now we're learning, again, uh, possibly should have been disbarred or disallowed in this process uh, from receiving money, who may have received that money. And uh, we, uh, we intend to uh, also bring uh, this, uh, this report to our DOT uh, and uh, T&I committee, and uh, we'll continue to follow this. But appreciate, again, your work about the, uh, uh, the Inspector General and the, uh, this committee. Thank you. I thank the gentleman from Florida for his statement. Now, at this time, we will introduce our panel of witnesses. Mr. Calvin Scovell, the third Inspector General of the United States Department of Transportation, welcome. And Mr. Richard L. Skinner, Inspector General for the United States Department of Homeland Security, welcome. Mr. Donald A. Gambatessa, Inspector General for the United States Agency for International Development, welcome. Mr. Gregory H. Woods, Deputy General Counsel for the United States Department of Transportation. Ms. Elaine C. Duke, Under Secretary for the Management of United States Department of Homeland Security, welcome. 
and Mr. Drew W. Luton III, acting assistant administrator for the management United States Agency for International Development. Let me welcome all of you to the committee. It's a long-standing policy that we swear all of our witnesses in. So if you would stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth? If so, answer in the affirmative. Right, you may be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. Um, I would like to just go right down the line. Uh, uh, as you know, the procedure is that uh, the light starts out on green, then it goes to yellow, which means uh, wind, start winding down, and then it goes to red. Everywhere in America, red means stop. So, uh, Mr. Scoville, why don't we start with you, and then we'll come right down the line with those, with keeping that in mind. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Issa, members of the committee, thank you for inviting me here today to testify on DOT's suspension and debarment program. Over the last four years, the Department's contract and grant obligations averaged $56 billion annually. Given the significant dollars at stake, plus an additional $48 billion in ERA funds, it is imperative that parties who should be suspended or debarred not receive federal contracts and grants. However, weaknesses in DOT's S&D program make these funds vulnerable to unethical, dishonest, or otherwise irresponsible parties. Today I will focus on two major weaknesses. First, delays in DOT's S&D decisions and reporting. And second, the lack of effective management controls and oversight. These weaknesses were found at the Federal Highway Administration, Federal Aviation, Aviation Administration, and Federal Transit Administration, which together represented more than 90 percent of DOT's S&D activity over a recent three-year period. Over the past two years, we have reported on major delays in DOT's S&D decisions and reporting. Our work found that on average, the operating administrations we reviewed took over 300 days to reach a suspension decision and over 400 days to reach a debarment decision. In one recent case, Federal Highways took 10 months after receipt of our suspension referral to suspend individuals charged with bribery, conspiracy, theft, and obstruction of justice. Federal Highways delay in making a suspension decision resulted in the Commonwealth of Kentucky awarding $24 million in ERA-funded contracts to companies that we believe met the legal test to be considered affiliates of these individuals. Several factors contribute to these delays. First, operating administrations generally do not expire. I now yield to the five minutes of the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I guess I'm inclined to ask about specific issues such as uh, uh, once an entity has been suspended or debarred, they must be entered into the um, EPLS system within five days. Uh, that doesn't include those that are terminated, which seems to be a, a shortcoming here. But listening to you and the fact that we're here the second time in a year going over the exact same things, I guess I wonder, to an extent, if you were in my place, what difference does it make? You begin to get the impression that the agencies, uh, if they don't like something, they're not going to do it anyway. They're not going to file data within the prescribed period. They're not going to pursue issues on a timely basis. And here's my, my personal favorite. Department procurement officials characterize the process as being too uh, resource intensive, punitive, and negatively impact the size of the contractor pool. That's my favorite. We want a, a large pool, so even if we have inept performance. You know, one of the things that the Inspector General's um, report says, and I'm going to quote from the report, the Department is reluctant to apply the policies and procedures against poorly performing contractors. Department procurement officials characterize the suspension and debarment process as being too resource intensive, punitive, and as negatively impacting the size of the contractor pool, and that the agency prefers to use what the Inspector General called other administrative remedies. Now, would you agree that the 
suspension and debarment procedure is intended to be punitive and that there are cases in which contractors ought to be punished for egregious violations of law? The, the suspension and debarment system is to protect the government, and that's what I think it's principal is what? purpose. Is what? Is to protect the government and the taxpayers' dollars. Well, I, I know that, but, you know, I'm trying to get some response from you about uh, do you just, do you feel you have enough resources to pursue debarment, or, or are you not able to do it because you just can't get into debarment cases because they're so costly? What, what, how, what's your philosophy on that? Would you rather not get into debarment issues and just use administrative? No, that's discipline? not true. In terms of, I, I think what Mr. Skinner said earlier about the start of, of the Department of Homeland Security and the shortage of the resources did, con did contribute significantly. It's very time consuming to record past performance and to do the, the full complement of contract administration. And I think we're working towards two things. One is getting resources on the management side. I think the second, um, the second area we're looking for is, is focusing not just on speed, but doing business well, as Mr. Skinner said. Hey, Mr. Chairman, time, my, my time's expired, but I'd ask the chair uh, uh, this, that if the chair would, would, um, would join me in, in a request for information about the status of uh, Blackwater and or XE with respect to Homeland Security. Would that objection be delighted to do so? I now yield five minutes to the gentlewoman from California, Congresswoman Speer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to applaud you for holding this hearing today. I think if this committee dedicated the next six months to really improving the um, response by these agencies, we would have done a great service to the American people. I believe that this is simply scandalous to think that a company that actually pled guilty in 2005, pled guilty in 2005, continued to receive payments by the federal government for two additional years before any action was taken to disbar it is absolutely unacceptable. There is no way that you can justify that under any set of circumstances. Now, I believe that part of the problem is that the inspector generals don't have any teeth. I think, based on what I've heard today, you make recommendations and the various agencies can take you up on those recommendations or not take you up on those recommendations. For instance, Mr. Luton said that he agreed with most of the recommendations by the Inspector General, but not all of them. So I have a question for you, Mr. Um, Gambatesa. Uh, what recommendations did they not embrace, and do you think that those recommendations should be embraced? And if so, what should we do about it? Uh, thank you. Uh, obviously, we think all the recommendations should be embraced or we wouldn't have made them. Uh, the, the three that they hadn't reached management decision on um, so far had to do with the restructuring of the, um, of the office, establishing a permanent office and uh, consultation with the, uh, the oversight board. The, um, I, um, you know, to, to say that the IGs don't have teeth, well, our, our teeth, I think, are our ability to uh, press the agency and um, forward our reports to the Congress if the agencies don't respond uh, to final action within the allotted period of time that's required by the Inspector General Act. So I think uh, in that way, we, we do. We also have the ability to uh, elevate recommendations to the head of the agency if, uh, if they're not uh, uh, responded well, with, to. With all due respect, I mean, this is a very busy place. And we'll hold a hearing, and we'll kind of flush it out, and we'll put a spotlight on it. And then we go about working on any number of other issues. And another year passes by, and then maybe there's another hearing. So I really believe that this committee needs to, one, introduce a bill that requires that each of these agencies have an Office of Compliance, Disbarment, and Suspension so that they are solely focused on looking at these contractors to see if, in fact, they have complied with the law, complied with their contracts. I don't think that's going to happen otherwise. There'll be some 
effort made by some of these agencies to do a little bit. But unless you have someone dedicated to this function, it's not going to take place. And based on your comments, it sounds like USAID is not all that interested in complying with that recommendation. And to you, Mr. Luton, I was just in Pakistan. And I met with one of your representatives there who was bemoaning the fact that one of the contractors, a U.S. contractor, who had a large sum of money was expected to build X number of schools. And I think the number was 30, but don't hold me to it. And in fact, over the course of the contract, they had only built five. Now, I don't know how you rank that. Is that non-performance? Or is that circumstances beyond their control? But to, to me, that's non-performance. That person should no longer be a contractor with the United States of America. Um, if this excluded party system is not even observed by the agencies, then it's not working. And we've got to come up with a better system. And that's why I think it's going to require Congress to do some of the heavy lifting here in, in order to have some accountability. because. The inspector generals can recommend, but you can choose not to take them up on their recommendations, and you might get a slap on the hand here, but that may be the end of it. So to you, Mr. Luton, if you would just comment on whether or not you think building five schools instead of 30 schools has met the performance requirements. Could I, uh, perhaps I could. I, I would like to comment on your, the comments earlier with, uh, to Mr. Gambatisa. We accepted all of the recommendations that they've provided. The, what the, the issue was is that at the time the report was issued, we ag immediately agreed to take nine recommendations and needed to go uh, make some management decisions on how to implement the remaining three. So all we've completed action on six, and the uh, action on the remaining six are in process. Well, let me interrupt you. In your testimony, you said, as such, management agreed with the majority of OIG's 12 recommendations offered through the audit process. That's what you said in your testimony, your sworn testimony this morning. Uh, that's the, okay, then that's in error. That's a, that was the written testimony. Is it, no, I'm, 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 I did? Okay. I, right. The, um, with, we are acting on all of them, and uh, several have, the six have been completed. We have, a, we have taken the steps to establish a separate unit to focus specifically on contractor and grantee compliance and oversight uh, that will improve our uh, work with the EPLS system as well as uh, engage better with the interagency to gather more information and do compliance oversight better. And uh, we're, we're, we take this very seriously. On Pakistan, I, I would have to come go and get specific information. The security conditions in Pakistan and Afghanistan are big factors. That may be an issue in that matter. Uh, I, I just don't know the details of that. But the gentleman, gentlewoman's sound, time has expired. It does sound uh, like it's clearly something that needs to be looked at from a performance perspective. I yield now five minutes to the gentleman from California, Congressman Bill Bray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, um, let, me just, let me just say, as a former mayor and chairman of a county of over a million, I take a look at this, and I just can't fathom if we'd, how we'd ever allow this in local government. I mean, this is almost like the government version of too big to fail is too big to, to be effective or even decent. I mean, some of this stuff is just out, you know, at a local level would just be uh, nailed down really quick. There's not a city manager that would survive with this kind of lack of response to a problem. There's not a building inspector or a, um, you know, a public works director that would survive very, you know, six months with this kind of thing. And I hate to say it, it sort of really reinforces the argument of a lot of people in this town that you, Washington spending money is, has a built-in inefficiency in it that we should avoid with like, like the plague. Now, Mrs. Duke, when we got into Katrina, and I'm going to let you work on this because I'm going to shift over to the gentleman next to you, but I looked at Katrina. I was down there. I've got my wife's family's from New Orleans, and I, we've got a place in Mississippi, and I saw the way that handled. How many people were, that were in that fiasco of, of abuse and, and um, you know, money switching and everything else, how many of them have been disbarred and restricted from access? 
I mean, I understand when you work with Louisiana, you've got a state half under indictment and half under water. But this thing is a federal government's responsibility, not Louisiana's responsibility. The DOJ Procurement Fraud Task Force has indicted and convicted several um, um, contractors and individuals. Um, FEMA, we have, has not debarred anyone to my knowledge. Um, it's been handled through the DOJ uh, Procurement Fraud Task Force to this point. So in other words, you've got to be convicted before FEMA is going to restrict your access to any more contracts. You do not have to be convicted. I mean, there has been a conservatism that we're... we're well, who's been, who's been restricted who hasn't been convicted by FEMA? No one to the... To the okay, that's what I mean. As yes. You may say that, but in results, it's got USAID. One of the thing, untold stories, in my opinion, after going to Afghanistan and talking with people, is one of the great untold stories, is everybody's talked about the for-profit uh, abuses in Iraq under the Bush administration. No one seems to be talking about the so-called non-profits and their abuses and their corruption in the system in Afghanistan during the Bush administration. And I think that if there was one place that this committee should be able to find bipartisan effort is to find out why have we totally ignored the abuses of the nonprofits in Afghanistan in a time when we all are very aware of the for-profit violations in Iraq. You have any comments about the, the handling of those grants and those, those programs in Afghanistan with the nonprofits? They're subject to the same basic set of rules and approaches. Um, I, I would have to get back to you separately on the, the uh, you know, what actions have been taken on with respect to nonprofits. Some of our suspension and debarment actions are with respect to nonprofits, but I don't have the, the, uh, uh, the data specifically for Afghanistan. We also work with uh, organizations on compliance agreements. Sometimes compliance agreements are done in conjunction with um, uh, investigations by the Department of Justice or, 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 or actions by the Department of Justice and entered into for in settlement cases. In some cases, is it uh, they're done apart from uh, a legal setting. Okay, and let me just take, all of us should be responsible for this, but wouldn't you admit that Congress, the oversight agencies, the media have not given the same attention to corruption or abuses in the nonprofits, especially in Afghanistan, that has been focused on the for-profits in other countries? Wouldn't you agree that culturally, at least in the major appearance, is that the same hard standard is not being applied to nonprofits as it has been, at least from the media and the attention by Congress, if not by the agencies themselves, that we've done with the for-profits? I'm doing a sort of a quick mental scan of news articles and so on, and that there may be that yep. impression, but that is not our approach with respect to, um, oops, sorry. Um, we, we, we should be treating them the same yep. as federal dollars. Would the gentleman uh, yield? Uh, yes, I'd yield. Just a quick follow-up. Mr. Duke, if I understood you correctly, seven, 200, since two, in, as of 2007, 768 people were convicted, far more were charged, and yet FEMA has, in the, related to Katrina, FEMA has zero debarments. Th that is correct, Mr. Issa. Okay, then on behalf of the committee, why wouldn't we author a bill that created immediate and automatic debarment at the time of a conviction? You have discretion at the time of an accusation. You have discretion at the time of the indictment. But why would the chairman and I not author a bill that would simply create automatic debarment so that your failure of your agency years later, and I have 2007, but you've made it clear that you haven't done anything as of 2010, that if this is not 400 days. This is zero response. Have you have any answer for why the chairman and I shouldn't simply author a bill and, and take it out of your hands, at least as to criminal convictions? Well, I mean, it has to be dealt with either way. I mean, we are, um, it is something we'll deal with. Um, such a bill would, would not be, um, no, I can't say anything about why. You, you, would you wouldn't oppose it since obviously FEMA hasn't done anything about these 768 people who have been convicted. No, I would not oppose it at this point.
Well, uh, to reclaim my time, it sure be convenient n not to have our contracts being administered right. out of General. a, a uh, federal penitentiary cell, right? Gentlemen. Thank you. <laughs> Gentlemen's time has expired. <laughs> uh, and now you have five minutes to the gentlewoman from California. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, since I'm just now getting here, I don't know if some of these questions have been asked, but I will go over them too. Uh, <clears throat> Since uh, 1975, USAID has experienced a gradual downsizing of its staff. For instance, in 1990, uh, USAID had nearly 3,500 people administering uh, $5 billion a year in aid. But as of 2009, there were only uh, 2,200 people overseeing more than $8 billion annually. And uh, during the uh, Secretary's confirmation hear hearing, Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, she highlighted this issue, stating that USAID has half the staff it used to have, while foreign aid and reconstruction efforts have been increasingly privatized. And how would you say the decrease in staff has affected USAID's ability to optimally implement federal acquisition regulations. And let me ask um, Mr. Gambatisi if you can respond. Yes, thank you. Um, in, um, in other audits also that we've performed over the last few years, we found that there was a a lack of staffing in the contracting area, and uh, we've made recommendations to the agency to uh, for for that improvement, and they and they have taken action to to hire uh, contracting officers and uh, uh, contracting officer technical representatives and others to to oversee contracting problems. There was also a problem with training of contracting officers we found in a, in a previous audit report. Not not this one with suspension debarment, um, and they have taken action on a number of those issues. Uh, I won't, Can I won't you bring speak. the mic closer I'm to sorry. you? I, I won't speak for Mr. Luton, but uh, in, in this specific audit uh, and suspension and debarment, um, it wasn't specifically brought out that the problem was lack of staffing. However, the way the office is structured with um, a, 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 a small number of individuals doing a number of different jobs, one would have to say that they need more people to do the job more effectively. I mean, even though we didn't really look at that specifically in the audit, uh, one, one could draw that conclusion. Mr. Luton. Yes, um, we have uh, in recent years received the funding and focused our attention on hiring additional staff, particularly foreign service officers. This will include uh, a substantial number of uh, foreign service officers in what you might call you the, stu the excuse me the stewardship down. backstops contracting officers financial mm -hmm. controllers uh, administrative managers as well as in technical specialties because they're involved in procurement and grant making as well this is going to put us in a better position to manage the process of planning and executing programs uh, engage more directly take uh, just provide better oversight there are a number of components to oversight in federal procurement and grant making. Suspension and debarment is part of it, but it's, it, the, the rest of it is really important too, and we're, we're putting ourselves in a better position to uh, manage the resources, the increase in program resources that have been provided in recent years. Um, so we're, uh, it's, it's something that has received attention in the last uh, three fiscal years, and we're, we're acting on that to, to build the capacity back towards where it should be. The development work that USAID undertakes in Afghanistan is critical to this administration's mission in the region. And the military alone cannot achieve long-term stability for the Afghan people. One important USAID program is the Accelerating Sustainable Agriculture Program to combat the cultivation of opium poppies and to provide long-term economic opportunities uh, to Afghans. The program was started in November of 2006 under a $102 million contract for uh, Chimononics. 
I think, is it, is it uh, Kimanonix? Okay. International. Unfortunately, a 2008 audit reported by USAID's Inspector General revealed that the two years into the program's implementation, the contractor could not prove that it had fulfilled any of the program's eight project goals. Uh, Mr. Luton, again, uh, after the release of the IG's audit report, did USAID increase their oversight of the program, and is there documented uh, proof that this contractor has since improved their performance, and has uh, Kimanonix received any additional USAID contracts? If, if you would permit, I would like to respond uh, separately sure. on the Kimonics contract. Uh, I will comment that the challenges in Afghanistan are significant, uh, particularly security related. Um, but if, if it is acceptable, we will provide you a separate response on, on that contract in Afghanistan and, uh, and your questions. I'd like to have it in writing. And uh, let me ask uh, Mr. Gamba Teza, has the Office of the Inspector General continued to review uh, USAID's Accelerating Sustainable Agriculture Program and their contractor? Yes, we, we continue to do um, a number of oversight activities in Afghanistan, and um, um, I would have to get back to you with the specifics on, um, on that program um, after the 2008 audit. I, I know we've done some other work, but I don't have it right here with me, but I, I certainly can get that to you. Mm -hmm. Do you uh, the gentlewoman's think time has expired. Would you like an additional minute? I just... Uh 30 seconds, right. I just wanted be to. be delighted to use additional okay. 30 seconds. Do you believe that USAID has the resources it needs to adequately monitor uh, this contractor's and, uh, performance and uh, the grant recipients? And that was the basis of my original question. Mm -hmm. um, in most of our audits, we will look at reasons why uh, something isn't uh, working satisfactorily and, and as I said earlier oftentimes we come up with uh, lack of oversight by contracting officers or those responsible uh, there could be a lot of reasons for this um, but uh, but to say they do or don't at this point is, is very difficult to say uh, we we sometimes we have to attribute these things to something and uh, it's easy to say they don't have enough people to do it but is that always the reason um, Sometimes it's lack of training, sometimes it's lack of oversight of the contractors or grantees, or sometimes it's lack of oversight by the contractors or grantees of their subs. And uh, without, a, you know, without getting into a specific audit, it's difficult to, to generally say what the problem is, but those problems all exist. In, in those problems exist in many of the audits that, that we have done in Afghanistan. Thank you very much. Um, uh, let me, um, uh, before we close out, um, you know, the ranking member uh, asked a question or raised an issue that I think that I want to sort of explore a little further. He indicated the fact that he says, uh, what did we need to do you know, in terms of from a congressional standpoint? Did you need additional tools, he said, in order to make this work? And the reason, you know, I want to sort of stay with this is that um, I remember a couple years ago, uh, a gentleman at the airport who indicated that he'd been in Washington working in government for 40 years. He went back to the Carter administration. He went on to tell me in terms of uh, how long he'd been involved. And he said that there's something that we did not look at, you know, when we come to these kind of centers and talk about, you know, waste and, and fraud and all of that. He said that some contracts require people, uh, uh, the contractor purchasing special kinds of things. He says, maybe it's a kitchen. He used the example. He says, and you buy all this equipment for this particular uh, company, and which is paid for out of government dollars in many instances. And then they do not perform. And rather than to go to somebody else, the fact that you've invested all this money in this particular item, that you say, well, we will ignore their behavior because it will cost us too much to move to somebody else at this particular time. Is this an issue? 
let me go right down the. Uh, is, this, is this is this a problem in any way? Is this into uh, does this kind of thinking go into it as a reason why sometimes there's not movement? Cost benefit of debarment. Yeah. The cost benefit of debarment. I'm, that's what we're really talking about. No, it should. I mean, we there are provisions that if you suspend or debar a contractor, that you can reprocure and actually charge those costs back. So if it's happening, it should it should not be happening um, that that way because we do have the ability to um, both deal with that contract or terminate that contract for default and recoup the taxpayer's dollars in an effective but way. But is the fact that it's a long process is that? Does that come into play as to why you don't do certain? I'm trying to get a picture here of why certain things are not happening. Mr. Chairman, I will, I, I will have to say that I think that the acquisition workforce federal-wide is under-resourced. And there was an indication uh, or a question earlier that I didn't get a chance to answer. Is it incompetence? I believe we have an extremely competent acquisition workforce in DHS. There is a shortage of people. Um, in, in the 80s and 90s, we cut the acquisition workforce and increased contracting dollars. And we're suffering from that. The department and, and our appropriators have, have helped us to, to start to recover, but I think we and the federal government are digging themselves out of a hole from in that whole area, and, and not just on suspension and debarment, but about effectively managing contractor performance in general. Anyone? Um, Mr. Mr. Chairman, as you said, this is suspension and debarment is, is the last line of defense. I think um, <clears throat> within the Department of Transportation, we're actively trying to keep fraud from happening before you get to this. From my information, for example, our, we only had 24 or so suspension or debarments during the course of 2008. But that doesn't mean that we're not focused on stopping fraud before people enter into contracts. Um, for, for this, I think that what we, so 24 of the number of contracting actions that we're involved in is a relatively small part of, of, our, of our activity. What we need to do is focus more attention on that last line of defense in addition to all the steps that we've been taking up to up to that point. And um, to answer your question, I think that your involvement in this process, along with uh, the uh, effective oversight of our inspector generals, has been very helpful in, uh, in uh, helping us to sustain management oversight of the program. Mr. Luton, yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm out of, out of order here. I, uh, I don't think that the, the concerns about uh, taking action and then needing to reprogram or reprocure or, or behind the delays or behind the um, weaknesses in, in the approach to suspension and debarment. I think it's been lack of focus. I think it's been lack of resources devoted specifically to suspension and debarment, and that's why we're, we're in the process of, of refocusing and, and resourcing the effort. Um, I, I do absolutely agree with Ms. Duke's comments that the, the federal procurement workforce is solid, but the amount, uh, the volume of dollars that have gone through federal contracts and grants in recent years has escalated dramatically, and the infrastructure, the human infrastructure and the systems infrastructure to keep up with that uh, has not caught up yet. So that's, that's the overarching issue. Uh, suspension and debarment is a portion of that, and, you know, specific to this hearing, we're going to do our part to, to, to focus our efforts on better suspension and debarment uh, activities. Well, you, let me thank you for your testimony this morning and to say to you that um, uh, we really need to do better. And we're willing to work with you to do better. You know, and is it something that we need to do? I know some couple of members mentioned possible legislation. You know, I, you know I, I'm, I'm not there yet. But the point of the matter is, is that uh, um, we have to make certain uh, that tax dollars are not wasted. I mean, we have an obligation and responsibility to make certain that uh, the money goes to do the kind of things that uh, we're saying they're going to do. So uh, I want to thank you again for your testimony and let you know that we will be following up on this because we see it as being very, very serious. And um, uh, the fact that not too much is happening. You know, so when you have a situation where not too much is happening, people continue to do whatever it is uh, and, 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 and without any corrections. So the point is that we need your help in that regard. And, of course, the inspectors, um, that when they make recommendations, I mean, I think we should take them very, very seriously. So thank you again for your, your, your testimony. Thank you.
committee will adjourn for uh, two minutes. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you.
gönderiyor. We haven't gotten cable. Bills include you. you want? H. Conrez, 244, introduced by Representative Phil Gingrey of Georgia. This measure expresses support for the goals and ideals of the National Day of Recognition for Long Term Care Physicians. I have a manager's amendment at the desk that makes some technical changes to this resolution, and I ask unanimous consent that this amendment be adopted and considered as the base text without objection, so ordered HRES 1040, introduced by Representative Vic Snyder of Arkansas. This bill honors the life and accomplishments of Donald Harrington for his contributions to the literature of the, in the United States. HRES 1174, introduced by Representative Lynn Woolsey of California. This measure supports the goal and ideals of National Women's History Month, HR 4840, Introduced by Representative Patrick Tiberi of Ohio, this measure designates the facility of the United States Postal Service located at 1979 Cleveland Avenue in Columbus, Ohio, as the Clarence D. Lumpkin Post Office. These are all worthy measures, and I urge their adoption. Does the ranking member have any comments on these great ideas and great naming of these institutions by these outstanding members of the United States Congress? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you for holding this business meeting. And we have reviewed the postal namings and resolutions as amended and find that they meet the requirements of the committee. I would like to put particular emphasis on a rather thoughtful one, HRES 1040, authored by Vic Snyder. As I reviewed the, uh, uh, the accomplishments of Donald Harrington, I found a life story that I believe is an example of where Congress, when Congress takes a moment to note the life and accomplishments of individuals, it costs us virtually nothing. One might say it even fills the empty time, uh, so often on the floor. But when I looked at a man who, as a 12-year-old, lost his hearing and yet did not lose his ability to think and to create, whether it was his first a novel, The Cherry Pit, or the more than a dozen additional novels he authored throughout his life. He did represent somebody who overcame adversity, 
and who added to uh, the enjoyment of generations before us and generations to come. So I'd like to thank the chairman, but particularly note Mr. Snyder's uh, attentiveness to this individual after his passing. And with that, I yield back and urge support for all the bills. I thank the gentleman from California, ranking member, for his um, uh, statement. I ask unanimous, unanimous consent that the measures previously described be reported favorably to, by the committee without objection, so ordered. This concludes our business for today. The committee stands adjourned.